Uh, I am Marta Hernandez, the Executive Director for Californians Together, which is a coalition of 25 powerful organizations that represent all segments of the education community, from teacher, school board member, administrator, parent and community, and civil rights organizations. Uh, we advocate and promote equitable education policy and practice for California's English learners, our emergent bilingual students. And uh, to set the stage, and as most of you well know, uh, since 2012, more than 825,000 people nationwide who came to the US as children have been able to take advantage of the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrival Program and that we refer to as DACA. California is home to the largest number of DACA recipients, uh, somewhere between 183 and 184 uh, in 2020, of which the highest numbers are from Mexico, Central America, the Philippines, China, India, and Vietnam. Most of them arrived to the US at a very young age, have lived here for more than 20 years, and for all of them, this is their home. Thanks to DACA, these individuals have been protected from deportation and were provided work permits. Um, they've had the opportunity to stay in school, go back to school, start a business, become independent, become successful professionals and give back to their communities and contribute to the economic prosperity of us all. It is important to note that there are also an estimated 4,300 DACA recipients who are educators in California, teaching hundreds of thousands of children every day online or in person in schools across our state. And if you are on the call today, we'd like to take a moment to recognize and honor you. The past few years have not been easy for these students and their families family separations, deportations, and attempts to end DACA all had a chilling effect on our communities. In the midst of the pandemic, the contributions of these immigrants and their families were appreciated more than ever as more than 200,000 documented people work on the front lines every day Yet sadly, many of them were left out when it came to COVID relief due to their immigration or mixed family status. But today is a new day. And with the reinstatement of DACA and bipartisan immigration reform work taking place as we speak in the halls of the Capitol, we have a renewed sense of hope. So we are here today because we know that there are an estimated 300,000 who are now eligible to apply for the first time and it's our turn to be on the front lines to support them. Our schools play a vital role in ensuring that all of them receive the information and documentation that they need to take advantage of this program. So whether you're an educator, a counselor, a family liaison, a school clerk, a school administrator, a school board member, or a student leader, we thank you for being here. And we hope that you walk away with the knowledge, the resources, and the connections that you need to best support the immigrant students and families in your communities. And so at this time, I'm gonna hand it over to Ruth Barajas, Director of the Supporting Immigrant and Refugee Students Project at Californians Together. Ruth. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, and thank you. Thank you again for joining us. Um, I'd like to take a moment to review the agenda. Um, and then uh, Crystal ZS will be going over some of the tools we have for engagement today. So um, if you could move to the slide with the agenda. First, we'll have up today, we'll have Araceli martinez Ogin from the National Immigration Law, Immigrant Law Center, who will be providing us with an overview of DACA program and an update on related legislation that may impact immigrant students and families. Then we'll have Rocio Preciado from Immigrants Rising, who will be speaking today on the importance of screening, resources, and opportunities for students with or without DACA 
accessing college and entrepreneurship opportunities and more. We will have a virtual table talk in a breakout session to integrate new learning and inspiration from our speakers, uh, followed by a question and answer session. Um, and we'll be compiling those questions throughout um, both of the presentations. So feel free to use that chat. I know Crystal will talk to you about that. And then as well as um, after the, the breakout. And we'll wrap up the day discussing what role we can play in schools and districts to ensure that we support our students and families with what they need to apply for DACA. And finally, we'll end our day with a voice, a voice from Elmo, Elmo Tumbakan, a student who represents the hundreds and thousands of young people across the state and country who we are here for today. So Crystal. Good or well, actually, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Crystal Diaz and I'm the administrative assistant for Californians Together. Um, Susan, can you go to the next slide, please? And I'll be going over the logistics and some engagement tools for you guys today. I will be adding into the chat a link to today's agenda and a note taker, so please feel free to use it throughout our presentation. Uh, throughout this webinar, everyone will be muted. The chat room will also be monitored for a Q&A that's going to be presented later on in the webinar. And the webinar is also recorded and a copy of the PowerPoint and resources shared will be uh, sent out after the, the session. Okay, um, great. So um, we're going to begin with our uh, introduction. Next slide, please. Of our first speaker, uh, our first speaker is Araceli Martinez Olguin, who is a supervising attorney at the National Immigrant Law Center. At NILC, Araceli focuses on protecting immigrants' civil and workplace rights in the face of immigration enforcement and on defending the employment authorization and immigration relief available through the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals. She's a seasoned impact litigator who has worked for over 15 years to advance and defend immigrant rights. Prior to joining NILC, Araceli worked for the U.S. Department of Education, Office for Civil Rights, the ACLU National as a member of the Women's Rights Project and Immigrants' Rights Project, and Legal Aid at Work, the National Origin uh, and Immigration Rights Program. Araceli received her JD from the University of California Berkeley's Law School and earned her undergraduate degree at Princeton University School of Public and International Affairs. Before law school, Araceli also taught bilingual kindergarten through Teach for America in Oakland, California, and she herself is a Mexican immigrant. She will be providing us with an overview of the DACA program and an update on related legislation that may impact immigrant students and families. Welcome, Araceli. Thank you so much, Ruth, and thank you everyone for being here. Um, as you'll see as we start to walk through the slides, um, some of what I'll be doing is very foundational. Um, and to the degree that you know this, fabulous. Let's hope that there's just something I provide you uh, that that is new. Um, the first thing you'll see on the next slide is this beautiful picture of folks demonstrating um, with a very simple little question there, which is what is DACA? And as I'd like to remind folks, uh, DACA is a policy that was hard fought for and won by immigrant youth. Right, there was a lot, there were many years of, of direct actions and putting pressure on the Obama administration that eventually led to the administration creating this, creating the DACA program, right? Which as, as you all likely know, happened in 2012. Uh, and what it does is protect from deportation certain undocumented individuals who came to the United States as children. In addition to protecting folks from deportation, DACA recipients are eligible for work authorization, um, a social security number, and through state laws can then obtain state issued identification and or driver's licenses. Uh, DACA, however, does not grant lawful status, um, such as a visa or a green card, nor does it offer a pathway to citizenship. It does, however, allow folks to live lawfully in the country that they call home. Um, the, the next just foundational piece we're gonna cover, you'll see on the next slide, I put a picture of the memo that created DACA, right? This was a memo signed by the secretary of, the then secretary of Homeland Security, uh, 
Jay Johnson creating DACA. And so just a quick walkthrough on the next slide of what who is eligible for DACA, right? What are the what are the things that a person needs to demonstrate in order to obtain DACA? Now, as we said, this was created, this was signed, the memo by Jay Johnson was signed on June 15th, 2012. Uh, and so on that day, uh, to be eligible for DACA, one needed to be under the age of 31, right? So there's an age cap. Um, you had to have come to the United States before having turned 16. You had to have continuously resided in the, in the United States for the five years before the memo was signed, so starting June 15th, 2007. You had to be physically present in the United States on the day the memo was signed, June 15th, 2012, as well as when you filed your request for DACA. You had to have no lawful status on that day, uh, which meant either that you'd never had lawful status or that you had uh, lost it sometime prior to that day. You had to be currently enrolled in school, graduated, uh, or obtained a certificate of completion from high school, had obtained, need, you need to have obtained a GED, or, um, honor, or, to, or be honorably discharged from, um, from the armed forces or from the Coast Guard. And uh, you had to not have been convicted of any felonies, a significant misdemeanor, or three or more uh, misdemeanors of any sort, nor could one be uh, a threat to national security or public safety. Right, so all of these things that someone must demonstrate and show in order to be eligible for DACA. And as you all may remember, um, right, there were big drives back in the day to get folks signed up and, and, and taking full advantage of DACA. Um, and we know that many people did. And so on the next slide, what you'll see are some of the, are some of the statistics that have already been shared with you, um, that Marta shared with you all as we started, right? Just a little bit about what we know, which is that at present, 1.1 million people are currently eligible for DACA. We know that about 650,000 individuals ha currently have it. Um, and that since 2017, and we'll talk in a minute about why 2017 is, is a number of importance, uh, is a year of importance in, on this slide, um, right, that since 2017, an additional 300,000 people have become eligible for DACA. Um, what we know is, is, you'll see a little bit there about the breakdown of DACA recipients, and I'll share that these numbers are a little stale, uh, they're from July 1st, 2020, but it is the best data that we have um, as it is the last time that the US um, published data, uh, presented data uh, given to one of the courts in one of the lawsuits. Um, and so this is the breakdown that we have. Um, I deeply appreciate the, the demographic information Martha provided you um, in terms of the fact that there are people from all over the world who have DACA, but the top five countries, as you'll see there is, is Mexico by far, and and then um, El Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras, and Peru. They're, they're the top five countries uh, from which recipients hail. Um, and also noteworthy is that right, California does in fact, like California is, has the most DACA recipients followed not far behind by Texas. And then you'll see Illinois, New York, and Florida bring up, um, have, a good, have a good percentage themselves. Um, so let's talk for a minute about why um, 2017 is important and or what, what that number, what, what that year uh, has, what made that year significant? Um, because as you all know, yes, DACA was created in 2012 by the Obama administration and then past that, um, but, but then we get what I would call at best wishy-washy sentiments from the Trump administration, right? As, as he comes into office, um, you hear these lovely sentiments of, of, you know, we love these kids, but at the same time, you also start to hear murmurs about the fact that they're, that they're planning to do away with the program. And on the next slide, you'll see, I've, I've put together a small timeline there for you all, um, highlighting first what, what becomes the first blow to DACA. Right. The, the the piece to keep in mind here is that, and you you know, no one knows this better than DACA recipients themselves and immigrants themselves. This has been a bit of a roller coaster ride. Um, so, right, DACA is created, but once you switch administrations, you have a new administration. You have the Trump administration that decides that it wants to rescind DACA. Right. So that's on September fifth. Do, um, Elaine Dukes, who is then the Secretary of the Department of Homeland Security, signs a memo much like the one we looked at a moment ago, except it's doing away with DACA altogether. 
in within uh, within a matter of days and weeks. Um, lots of lots of folks fly into fly into court to file lawsuits to stop that rescission. Right, there are a total of ten lawsuits nationwide brought by brought by the, the brought by university systems, by private corporations, by counties, by and mo and most importantly, from from my perspective, also from DACA recipients themselves. Um, the National Immigration Law Center represents uh, well. Now we represent nine DACA or we represent five DACA recipients and four folks who qualify for DACA. At the time, we represented six DACA recipients and a community organization that has DACA recipients within its members. Um, and so, right, folks go to court, file lawsuits, and manage in, in a matter of months to get court orders that stop the government from, from, from rescinding DACA fully. Um, but also, you know, there's a degree to which I would say, right, it's not, it's not wholly successful. We do not keep the whole program going, right? The part that we're able to keep, the part that the courts let us have are, are renewals, right? We are told that for the folks who already have DACA, they have very strong interests that the government can't just roll over. And so it's renewals that are kept open. So right, the the courts and the court in California that was considering this, the court in New York that was considering this, and then eventually the court in D.C. as well. They all say yes, renewals can continue, but we're not ready to let grants for advanced parole continue, and we're not ready to let uh, new people, right, uh, first-time DACA applicants, initial applications. We are not prepared to let those go forward. Now. Usually what happens when you win, right, in, in our federal court system, there are trial courts, there are courts of appeal, and then there's the Supreme Court. And normally the way court, the way a case proceeds, you start at a trial court, you appeal it to the court of appeals, and eventually you get to the Supreme Court, assuming that they take the question at all. There was a little used procedure um, of being able to appeal directly to the Supreme Court from the trial court level. Um, the Trump administration used that procedure more than any other administration that more than the than I think the, the past three administrations, the three administrations before it combined. And that is what happened with DACA. Right. Only only one of the courts of appeal, the Ninth Circuit, um, had ruled and said that the, that it was improper for the Trump administration to have rescinded DACA. Um, but the other courts were still mulling it over when on June 28th, 2019, uh, the Supreme Court granted cert. And that just means they agreed to hear this question. And they set the oral argument for November 12th. Now, I will spare you all the deep legal analysis I usually give because no one needs that at this hour of the day. Think, you know, it, it's I, if you have a, cu a cup of coffee, even then you, you don't need it right now. The, that deep, but here are the things that are important, right? What we know, at, at what's happening, the questions around that lawsuit or the questions posed in, before the Supreme Court are about whether or not the Trump administration procedurally did all the things it was supposed to do to be able to rescind the program, right? And in before the court at that moment, there's no question, the court is not examining DACA's legality. And I flag that for you all because as we keep walking sort of about where we are with DACA right now and why the legislation that is starting to get proposed and introduced, why it's so important, this will become uh, particularly relevant. So we have the oral argument. Um, you know, if you if you were reading the papers, uh, on, the oral argument is held on November 12th, and on that day and the day after, if you were reading the papers, the you know Adam Liptek from the New York Times, Nina Totenberg from NPR, everybody said we were going to lose, and in all candor, you know, yeah, the arguments didn't go. They probably were not as as. I would have liked to have heard more judges seemingly on our side than I heard that day. Let's say that. So we're coming out of the Supreme Court and in order, we wanted, we worked very hard to ensure that in the court that day, DACA recipients, impacted folks, right? Folks who, for whom this decision might, would, would actually mean something, 
got to be in that courtroom hearing the questions that were being asked. Um, and when we came out um, in the in the chat, maybe or in your resources later, um, there was this amazing moment, right? There's a rally happening outside the Supreme Court, and folks and folks from within from within the courtroom come down the stairs, and before you and before we could see it, we could hear the chanting that we are that home is here. Right. And and I'll leave it, I'll leave you with that and and hope that you'll take a moment to to check out what MSNBC captured because it was it, it was chilling and stunning and a wonderful reminder of exactly the power that immigrant youth can 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 yield. Um, so six, seven months, seven months of waiting, and we get a Supreme Court decision. And to everyone's surprise, in, including ours to some degree, right, we get a Supreme Court victory. The Supreme Court agrees that ultimately. Uh, what the, the way the Trump administration tried to get rid of DACA um, doesn't is, does not comply, does not conform with our laws about the procedures through. So Araceli, which administration? Um, you must, what you said, Araceli, we missed you for a moment there. Yes, uh, I was saying simply that uh, after several, I think I've seen it after several months of waiting, we get a Supreme Court victory. And while, and thank you, Ruth, for putting the the link of the of the amazing moment from the Supreme Court in the chat. Um, we get a victory after all, which leads to some uncertainty, right? What we get from the court is a statement that the government didn't prop didn't take the steps it was supposed to or needed to in order to rescind the program, right? There's nothing from the Supreme Court that says they cannot rescind the program. And so unsurprisingly, perhaps within the next six weeks, there is another memo. You all may remember that when the Supreme Court decision came out in June, everyone, we were all very excited because seemingly that restored DACA to 2012 DACA. And yet what we see in six within six weeks is the Trump administration trying again to limit DACA, all right? And that's another memo signed by the then Secretary of Homeland Security, a de per the person acting as, as uh, Secretary of Homeland Security, Chad Wolf. Now, the, the piece here, the piece here to, that is worth noting is, is simply that, right, it, that just, re that uh, from our side, that requires another lawsuit. Right, because we understand full well that the Supreme Court said what it said. Um, and so we go back into court, the National Immigration Law Center with our co-counsel at Yale Law School and Make the Road New York, go back into court. Uh, and on the next slide, you'll see the favorable decision. You'll see some, some notes and, and a little the front picture of the favorable decision from the court in the Eastern District of New York. Right, we are back in court. We were back in court arguing about the fact that Chad Wolf wasn't properly serving as the Secretary of Homeland Security, which meant that when he signed that memo, it was a dead letter. It had no significance from the start. And the court agrees with us. And on December 4th, Vake throws out that memo and restores DACA to 2012. And importantly, orders the government to start accepting initial DACA applications. Um, one of the other things that the Wolf memo did was shrink the DACA grant from two years to one year, and the court immediately re required them to extend those EADs, for the, e the employment authorization documents that had been granted from one year to two, and to post, a, and importantly, to post a public notice on its website saying that it was doing all of these things. Um, a, a week later, the court additionally ordered the government to mail individual notices to anyone who had received a one-year EAD, giving them a notice that that could serve as proof of the extension of their employment authorization document, those folks will be getting a new authorization document that set that is that shows that it's good for two years with uh, within 30 days of the expiration of the one they're currently holding. And letters were sent to folks who were wrongly prohibited from applying for initial DACA, right? There's this window of time post Supreme Court decision or a rather post Wolf memo between uh, July 28th and this court decision of, of November 14th when folks were, their initial applications were being rejected 
um, that was being done wrong, that was wrongfully being rejected, right? So all of those folks also got letters informing them that they that that DACA 2012, that initial applications were back on the table, and that though they had been rejected recently, they should go ahead and and apply again. Um, so here's the thing, right? In this moment, where we are right now, DACA DACA is back to DACA 2012. Right, we are in this space where initials are are available, initial applications are available, or application or DACA is available to people who qualify but had not been able to apply since 2017 when the Trump administration rescinded it. Um, so that's right. That's an important and noteworthy thing. Folks should be applying if they're if you right like encourage folks to apply. They should be. Um, but as tends to happen with DACA, and as we talked about, it is not a permanent solution. There are, there's at least, there's, there's one piece we have to note as at the, with this, in the same breath that we say, apply, 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 or renew, renew, renew. The other thing we have to point out is that there is a live case uh, in the Southern District of Texas, where the state of Texas, along with a small number of other states, are directly challenging DACA's legality. And the result of that lawsuit, um, if, if the court ultimately agrees that DACA is unlawful, that will throw, that will throw a, like, certainly that will stop initial applications. Um, the good news here, the, the piece worth knowing is that no one is asking for the court to take DACA away from anybody. But assuming that the court agrees with the state of Texas, it would essentially mean that renewals would stop and that the, then that folks who are holding current employment authorization documents and current deferred action grants, those would be allowed to expire, and then they would they would um, they would resort they would res return to being undocumented. Um, so, you know, two two things. One, I'm not going to leave you on that note because, again, I think that that's not the note on which we want to leave you. There are good things here to note too. Um, one, you'll notice at the bottom of the next slide there is a little bar that says, um, you know, please let DACA eligible folks know. Right, the the those of us those of us at NILC and and with our co-counsel, you know, the other thing that the court did was certify a class. Um, so we represent all 1.1 million people who are DACA eligible. So if the court, so that if the federal government is failing to comply with any of the court's orders, we are situated to enforce those rights. So right, we've we've created a website, dacaclassaction.com, um, so that folks can be in touch, so that DACA eligible folks can let us know about uh, any any issues um, issues related to DACA applications they may be having. Um, so that note, and then the final thing, because as I said, I'm not leaving you all with with horrible news of of the the last thing. The last word on Texas is we're we're all sort of we're all expecting we're all sitting waiting for a decision. Uh, the that court heard oral argument on the last sets of briefs that it needs to consider back in December. Um, it could come at any time, but the truth is that federal judges sort of rule when they want to. So there's no way. We lost you again there, Araceli. Really to know when that may come. Um, with another noted toward the beginning is that this is a new day. Right, we are. I wanted to just end by noting the favorable things that we have seen related to DACA from the Biden administration since they took office. Right, so before, even before the inauguration, we had heard from Biden and the Biden Harris administration that DACA would be a priority for them, which is why on January, which is why on day one, on, on, the, on January 20th, right, we know there's a presidential memo to preserve and fortify DACA. Now, it, what it does is tell the Secretary of Homeland Security to, to do everything that they can to accomplish that goal. And that's kind of the extent, that's the extent of what it does, right? It, it, that's the extent of what it does. But at least we know it means that there's an, this is not an administration that is going to look to dismantle DACA themselves. The other things worth noting are, right, and, and also on day one, the Biden-Harris administration uh, announced 
an immigration bill. The text was released on February 18th. Um, you know, a cornerstone of that bill is the creation of a new interim status uh, lawful prospective immigrant. Um, and it puts, it, it's a vehicle for, it's a, it's a vehicle for nearly all of the all undocumented folk in the country, you know, right, the 11 million, it's a, it can, it will, it, if it passes, it will serve as a vehicle for legalizing all of those folk. Okay, Araceli. And importantly, I'm and worth noting, I'm just gone, okay. You're back now. You want to, it sounds like you're wrapping up, but I want to make sure that we heard what you just last said. Thanks. Sure. The, the, I'm noting the fast track. I'm noting the fast track for citizenship for DACA recipients, for agricultural workers, for folks who currently have temporary protected status or deferred and for enforced departure. Um, you know, also very, also importantly, and which is new is there's a waiver in the law that allows people removed from the United States or who departed the United States under the Trump administration uh, to apply as well if they were continuously present for three years prior to leaving the United States. Um, the, the final thing, and, and you'll notice that on the slide, I, I have I put there also the Dream and Promise Act, uh, which was introduced into the House uh, yesterday, right? Essentially, right there are good there are good bills that are starting to make their way in the legislative process. I think the the one tempering note with regard to the bills, of course, is that they are bills, um, and the one thing that we do generally try to counsel folks is just to be careful about signing up for to get help to apply for remedies that are not yet available. But once you sort of put that piece to the side, it's what is clear is that there are there are at least some good proposals on the horizon that do not have the age cap that DACA does that shorten dramatically the amount of continuous presence that is necessary for one to prove. And with that, I will cease, I will cede the floor and stop having technical difficulties that impact all of you. Thank you so much, Araceli. And you know, we've all been through it, so no apologies needed. Um, you know, we've we've got the bandwidth, and we do what we can. So, um, what an incredible presentation, and so informative for everyone. Uh, those questions, I'm sure, are percolating. So, throw them in the chat. We're going to be compiling those, um, and um, after our second session, we'll be um, preparing for that question and answer. I'm going to go ahead and transition to our second speaker, Rocio Preciado was born in Guadalajara, Jalisco, Mexico. She immigrated to the United States at the age of nine, along with her parents and her younger sister. She grew up in Oakland, California, where she had the privilege of attending a college preparatory high school. Thanks to her optimism, family support, organizations like College Track and resources available at UC Santa Cruz, her college experience was a positive one. She graduated from UC Santa Cruz with a Bachelor's of Arts in Psychology and Feminist Studies. At UC Santa Cruz, she interned at the Educational Opportunity Program's AB 540 Student Services, where she supported and mentored college students. And now that she's graduated, she's eager to continue her support of students and ensure that they do not miss opportunities that can lead them to success. She currently works as the Community Education Manager and High School Engagement Manager for Immigrants Rising, an organization that empowers undocumented young people to achieve educational and career goals through personal, institutional, and policy transformation. She'll be speaking today about the importance of screening, and she'll share resources and opportunities for students with or without DACA, including access to college, financial aid, and entrepreneurship, among other things. Welcome, Rocio. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ruth. Thank you so much, uh, Araceli, also for the information that you shared around DACA. And like I was mentioning in my introduction, my name is Rocio Preciado. I'm the Community Education and High School Engagement at Immigrants Rising. And yes, um, my experience going through college was a positive one. And unfortunately, 
there are many folks, many students who do not get the opportunity to have that positive experience to be able to pursue their college and their career goals because of their immigration status and because of all of the misunderstanding that is happening with the laws and the policies. And so I'm gonna be speaking a little bit more about what are some of the options and the resources that are available for folks who may not be eligible for DACA. As you all heard throughout the eligibility and the presentation that was mentioned uh, by Araceli, one of the requirements for folks to be eligible for DACA, receive a work authorization, get the, prote the protection from deportation, is that they had to have lived in the United States continuously since 2007. And so unfortunately, there are also many folks who are not eligible for DACA because they do not meet the requirements of the presence here in the United States. And so while there's all these conversations that are happening around policy, immigration law, what's going to happen for folks who are undocumented, students and their families are still there to day wondering, is my pursuit of my high school education, is me trying hard in school, and is me pursuing college even worth the effort if my life is currently at stake in all of the political conversations and what's um, the uncertainty with their futures. And I can speak to one of my experience that I had to learn myself and I learned myself that I do not need DACA, I do not need legal permanent residency or citizen, citizenship to be able to go to college or be able to find opportunities to thrive. And this is something that we continue to see within our organization. Yes, it is super important to continue to do the advocacy work. There are a lot of folks who have the lived experience who are on the ground doing the advocacy work. Um, and yet again, there are still some opportunities that folks can take advantage if the system is set in place, if the infrastructure is set in place, and if we have the right messaging to be able to continue to have folks continue their education. Now, some of you might be wondering, um, and if we can go to the next slide. Some of you might be wondering, and these are some very common questions that happened and uh, take place amongst educators, which is, you know what, have a student who's undocumented, where can I refer them to, for them to be able to access resources? Um, some of the other common questions, um, the other common question is, what are some opportunities for my students without DACA? Now, one of the great benefits that happened after DACA was announced is that many undocumented folks were going to immigration attorneys to get screened for DACA. Now, when I was undocumented, I thought that I was going to die undocumented. I would think to myself, you know, well, my parents are undocumented. So there's no way that they can petition for me. I was dating a guy that was undocumented. I was like, well, that's clearly not gonna work if I marry him. And I had a lot of misconceptions as to what it meant to be undocumented. And one of the, one of the opportunities um, that came from DACA is that many folks began to go to immigration attorneys to get screened. Now, what ended up happening is that many undocumented folks who were getting screened for DACA ended up finding out that they were eligible for another immigration remedy that was permanent, and that would provide a pathway to citizenship or legal permanent residency. And that was the case in our situation. My sister, while she was in high school, she was um, a survivor of a crime. It was her English teacher who called the police and there was a police report that was filed. That later down the line, after I volunteered at an asylum office and doing some immigration screenings for other folks, I ended up realizing that my family was eligible for the U visa given that circumstance that had happened um, in our lives. And that was one of the advantages that came from getting an immigration screening. Now, if we go to the next slide, at Immigrants Rising, we have something similar. So we have an immigration legal intake, um, which is free, it's anonymous, and it's also confidential. Now, what this screening does is that folks from the comfort of their home, 
um, with support either of an educator or with a parent, they can submit this intake and find out if there are any potential immigration options available for them. Now, if you are an educator working closely with high school students, it is very important to make sure that young people are getting screened because there are potential immigration remedies that can lead to a pathway of legal permanent residency or citizenship, and they might age out the moment they turn 18 or the moment they turn 21. So this is one of the key important things to make sure that school districts begin to implement in their infrastructure, really the connection and the partnership with legal service providers to see if there are other alternative options for folks while we wait for um, immigration reform to happen and while we made further wait for there to be a more inclusive um, immigration policy. Now, there are probably folks who are ready um, ready to apply for DACA, those folks who are eligible, um, we are going to be adding in the chat another resource, um, immigrationlawhelp.org. It is a website where you can insert the zip code in which you reside, and it will provide you with a list of nonprofit organizations um, or low cost legal service providers that will support folks in being able to apply for any immigration options um, and also get immigration screenings. So that is another great resource that it's key to make sure that students are able to have access to. Um, and one of the things that I like to say is that I think of getting an immigration screening kind of like a doctor's checkup. It is one of those things where something might happen in someone's life that might change their circumstance. Um, and can lead to a potential option. Now, if we go to the next slide. Another um, really important thing is really understanding the differences of what is available out there for students. Um, DACA has been a hot topic in the news and as the, within our immigrant community, we tend to call everything um, dream act. We add the word dream to everything that we do, everything that we engage in, but it's really important to understand the difference of what is currently available in California. And so I'm going to be pointing out to um, two key things that are, that are important to keep in mind. Um, in California, we have in-state tuition laws. Now what that does is that it provides a discount for students and it waives the international fees for a student to be able to access college. Now, DACA, social security number, work authorization are not required to be able to access um, in-state tuition um, and to qualify for in-state tuition. In California, we also have the California Dream Act. Now in California, this is a law and this is a law that provides financial aid for folks who meet in-state tuition eligibility. And then we have DACA, which you all heard about, uh, which provides a work authorization um, for folks and there are certain requirements that need to be met. But it's really key um, and very important that educators know the difference between these policies um, in order to make sure that students are accessing the resources that are available to them um, at the moment, especially when they're in high school. Now, if we go to this next slide. Um, now I'm gonna go over a little bit about the California Dream Act. Some of you might be familiar with this, um, but I will say that um, another huge thing that happened following DACA is that it gave folks a sense of hope and possibility to then be able to go to college. When I was about to go to UC Santa Cruz, this was back in 2009, there was no state financial aid, there was no California Dream Act, um, there was no DACA, and all I was eligible for was in-state tuition. Now, I received a scholarship that was gonna cover my four years at UC Santa Cruz. And my family, uh, my extended family, their response was, why are you going to go to college if you're not going to be able to work anyways? What's the whole point of putting in all that work and all that effort? Now, that is the same question that many high school students are wondering and have asked. 
What's the whole point? Yes, means what's the whole point of then going to college if I'm not going to be able to work? And so it's really important to inform students about the California Dream Act to make sure that educators know that the California Dream Act um, does not require DACA for folks to be able to access state financial aid. And if we go to the same next slide. Now, what's the, what exactly is the California Dream Act and how come it doesn't require any kind of work authorization? So the California Dream Act, what it does, it allows students who meet the AB 540, AB 2000, or SB 68 eligibility to access university scholarships and financial aid through the state government. And this application is due every March 2nd for seniors. So it's pretty much something that mirrors the uh, FAFSA application. So if we go to the next slide. And some of the aid that is available for folks is all kinds of state financial aid and institutional aid. Now, one of the uh, areas that students who apply through the California Dream Act are not eligible for is they're not eligible for any kind of federal aid. So students are left many times with a financial gap, which then requires them to apply to scholarships to be able to then fund the rest of that financial gap for them to be able to pursue their college education. We go to the next slide. Now, there are many benefits that are available for students who meet the in-state tuition eligibility. And in-state tuition loss and the eligibility can oftentimes be confusing. Um, which is why at Immigrants Rising, we have an in-state tuition tool which provides educators and students with a guide, uh, an interactive guide to determine whether the student meets in-state tuition eligibility. Now, what happens when the student meets this in-state tuition eligibility through AB 540, AB 2000, um, SB 68? What happens is that that automatically gives the student access to apply to the state financial aid through the California Dream Act. So it, been, it opens up a wealth of opportunities for students. Now, if we go to the set, next slide. This is where educators, scholarship and career counselors play a key role in really understanding um, in-state tuition for their students. Uh, this is also where there is going to be a need to really partner with adult schools um, and also partner with continuation schools um, if you are part of a district. Um, because uh, the in-state tuition law, which was expanded in 2007, 2017, um, states that students who attend a school in California and it could be a combination of high school, middle school, elementary school, community college for up to two years, correctional school, adult school, um, or earn their credits. And if we go to the next slide, and meet the degree or transfer uh, requirements are able to uh, pay in-state tuition and then being able to access state financial aid. And so there is um, a lot of work that still needs to take place to make sure that educators are really understanding the difference, uh, really understanding the laws that would allow students to be able to pursue an education, which I uh, believe does open up additional doors for folks to be able to thrive. Now, if we go to the next slide, Now, as I mentioned, one of the key um, challenges for undocumented folks when we're thinking about state financial aid is that they're not eligible for the federal aid. And so this is where it's really important to create a scholarship culture within high schools. If we go to the next slide. If you're new to Immigrants Rising Resources, we do have a scholarship list that does not require proof of US citizenship or legal permanent residency for students to be able to apply. Now, again, it is extra important for undocumented folks to apply to scholarships to be able to fill in that self-help gap um, so that they can have a college experience um, with additional resources. 
Now, if we go to the next slide. Now, to the question that I mentioned earlier um, that many students have, which is, well, what is the point of going to college if I won't be able to work? When I graduated UC Santa Cruz in 2013, I still had not received my work authorization um, after my family applied for the U visa. Now, the U visa is given to folks who have been a survivor of a crime in the United States, filed a police report, um, and then are eligible for a work authorization, um, eventually legal permanent residency. Um, and at the time, I still had not received my work authorization. So graduating UC Santa Cruz, I was undocumented. And now I had to find alternative ways of earning a living. And so that led me to start a business and also take part in independent contracting options. So it definitely took being more creative with how I used my degree um, and the skills that I had in order to be able to contribute back um, to my community. And so I'm gonna go ahead and um, have folks go to the next slide and then play a short video of some of the work that we also engage in around entrepreneurship. So the question we have for all of you, I want you all to think of your wildest, craziest, but legal uh, business idea. I think the undocu hustle is really sort of a concept that every single undocumented person has to go through in this country to be able to, to make it here. I just have always grown up with the entrepreneurial spirit. My dad started working in the fields in the Central Valley in dairy construction and just basically took the step to, to, um, to, to start his own business. We have to be creative, we have to be entrepreneurial and create our own opportunities. How are individuals living the undocu hustle? How were they able to launch their businesses? What kind of businesses did I have? We invited undocumented entrepreneurs from across the country to come share their experiences. We also were able to provide business workshops uh, and also a Shark Tank, which was really exciting, where we brought funders and investors to provide feedback on pitches and ultimately some of the entrepreneurs ended up getting funded. I'm the co-founder of the Family Radiance Project, and we use uh, 360 video and virtual reality to uh, immerse undocumented families in the places they can't physically return to. Our idea was basically to import Tibetan handwoven rugs from India and Nepal made by Tibetan refugees and sell them online and in stores. By bringing me close to all these amazing undocumented young entrepreneurs who are doing such great work. That's where I draw most of my inspiration from. It takes me a, a long time, but right now it's like, okay, yes, I'm an entrepreneur now. So it feels good when they ask you how you do it, how you did it. For me, entrepreneurship made me realize what I was good at. And I want you to reflect on what you're good at. So in sharing my story, now there are people start, starting to like reminisce and when did I show an entrepreneurial mindset? And hopefully going forward, like when we see these moments of uh, people being really creative, uh, responsible risk takers, maybe we can explore an idea because you can learn a lot from putting out your own idea uh, and starting uh, something of your own. What goes on in these spaces is practical advice people can use. Um, again, we have a list of resources that we're going to continue to build upon uh, for um, everyone across the nation to get access to entrepreneurship support. I think for many undocumented individuals, um, the undocumented identity can really be their own limiting factor in what they can do. So when I talk about um, the undocu hustle or these entrepreneurship opportunities, I tell individuals, just forget about your immigration status. Just, this is the opportunity, don't think about it. That has, this has nothing to do with being undocumented. So what would you do? What can you do? Get your undocu hustle on. Thank you. Thank you. So now, had I known that when I was in high school, that there was a liable option to be able to earn a living through entrepreneurship, probably my college experience would have been a lot more 
creative, it probably wouldn't have been, I probably wouldn't have had as much anxiety and I probably would have come in with more, uh, a broader perspective of what I could do. Now in the United States um, in 2016, um, over 770,000 of undocumented folks were entrepreneurs. Um, in 2014, 9.5% had shared uh, that they uh, were entrepreneurs, folks who were of working age. And in 2016, it was reported that 15.2 billion um, was of business income came from those entrepreneurs. Now there are liable options and um, for folks who are undocumented, um, folks do not need a social security number or work authorization to be able to launch a business. Um, now, um, if we go to the next slide, it is never too early to introduce folks to this kind of mindset. And I think this is where oftentimes the education system oftentimes fails at providing folks and high school students and young people the opportunity to innovate, to be creative, to take risk. Um, and so we've been in partnership with Build, um, who has a virtual design challenge that actually introduces folks to that kind of curriculum that you can bring into your classroom and um, give folks an opportunity to share more of the context as to how it can be a liable option for folks independent of their immigration status. Now, if we go to the next slide, for those of you who maybe are working with uh, folks who are already ready in college, ready to think about the next step um, we do have a site on docuhustle.org, which provides more information about choosing your business structure, developing a business plan, uh, filing taxes, uh, registering your business. So that's another great resource um, that you can share and explore. Um, and lastly, uh, we need to continue to engage with young adults, uh, especially throughout uh, this time of virtual learning. So if we go to the next slide, one of the initiatives that we're doing at Immigrants Rising, we're trying to be more engaged um, through Instagram, um, trying to meet and find students where they're at. Um, and so we do offer Instagram live sessions every Tuesday at noon, um, where we answer college questions for undocumented folks. And so that's also an opportunity for high school students to connect with us, ask questions, and stay up to date with some of our resources. Um, and again, I think there's definitely a lot of work uh, left to be done. Um, and there is a lot of opportunities for partnerships and collaborations within our education system, within high schools. Um, and really, I invite you all to just think about what is the role that each person within your high school, within your institution can play in being part of the solution um, to this ecosystem of supporting undocumented students independent of their immigration status. And so thank you all for, um, for being here. I'll go ahead and pass it on to Ruth. Thank you so much. Um, that was incredible, Rocio. Uh, you have shared so much wonderful information with everyone on the call. And I can just only imagine how much they are absorbing this like sponges out there. So we really appreciate it. We've got some questions that are coming into the chat and we'll be compiling those. So please continue to put those in there. Um, and if some come up when you're in your breakout room, you could certainly um, be ready for that because we're gonna have some nice um, question answer right after our um, breakout room. So we're gonna go on to the next slide and we're gonna, we're gonna move to a moment where we're gonna talk around the virtual table. Um, we're gonna take uh, actually, we're going to be shortening this up to 12 minutes. Um, we're going to do a 12 minute breakout session. And we'd like you to focus on the questions, ensure everyone has had an opportunity to share or ask a question. Um, and the, we're encouraging you to share out those questions in the chat box when you come back or any resources that come out or that you share out. Um, and there is there are some slides that you can take some notes on if you wish. And so when you go to your breakout room, there'll be a breakout room number you'll see, and that's where you can kind of, you know, put notes in if you like. Um, and if you could move to the next slide, please, I'd like to just give you a little prompt, just something to think about. On the next slide, um, we have, uh, you know, the question of 
what is your role in supporting students and families with DACA? We have a diverse audience today. We know there are people who are counselors, teachers, office staff, administrators, all over the map. So what is your role? Kind of share that out with your group. And then what did you learn today that was new or that inspired you from the, present, from the presenters today? So what's your role in, in supporting students and what did you learn that was new or inspiring to you from the presenters? And we'll see you back here in 12 minutes. And I'm gonna um, have Araceli begin to address some of those questions. Hi everyone. So um, the the questions that were that were in the chat. There's one there about uh, whether how the continuing presence works. What is required to apply for DACA. And so just to restate that, right? One need, is going to need to demonstrate uh, that they have been continuously residing in the United States from June 15, 2007, continuously through their application and really through their grant. So right at this point, we're talking about needing to prove, what is that for? I'm doing the math. I'm, I'm reminded I'm not good at math, but right, you're going to have to do like 14 years of, of continuous presence. Um, so right, there's there's a reason why DACA, it, like the numbers of folks that are eligible, right, are sort of, it's a, it's, a fi it's a fixed number of folks, right? Um, so that, that's one question that was posed. Another, or there was a question in the chat posed about um, scholarships essentially, or money, uh, financial assistance available for DACA fees, right? And, and kudos to the person who raised it because it is a real issue, right? It's not an insignificant sum of money we're talking, and, right? And it assumes that, you've, that you find someone to do the application pro bono, which thankfully there has, there has been lots of money from the state to do that. So um, also in the chat, someone else highlighted uh, the Mission Asset Fund, that's also, that is a good place um, for that. I, as I understand it, one of the things that they do is they do these, they do loans that are um, zero interest. That if you are, that if you are uh, using the money to pay for an immigration application, they will loan you the money and you pay it back at, so with, but with no interest attached to it. Um, and I also wanted to highlight that, um, uh, oh my goodness, I just blanked on what UWD stands for. <gasps> um, uh, sorry, it'll come back to me in a moment. But United We Dream, United We Dream also has a scholarship fund uh, for DACA fees. Uh, it will surprise no one that, like the Mexican consulate, right? They they are tapped for that. They, that money goes quickly, but it's there. Um, and in terms of how else, you know, where else to get the money, you know, it's it's not the it, it's ultimately it's that's like all scholarship money. You, you, right? It, we need more of it in the world. Um, one other question in the chat that was posed had to do about the importance of having um, an ITIN number, um, how important it would be to have an ITIN number as possible documentation for the immigration bills that are that have been proposed. So if I'm if I'm reading the question right, I interpret that question to be asking about how helpful or necessary it would be to establish continuous presence. Um, now something that is revolutionary. I want you to take a moment and think about the fact that we were talking two seconds ago or a few minutes ago about the fact that for DACA, you have to show like 14 years of continuous presence, but with the new, the new bills that have been proposed, either, either for, um, either for DACA or, or right, either for um, the Dream and Promise Act or through the U.S. Citizenship Act, continuous presence is, is you have to show that you were present on January 1st, 2021. Right, you only have to show that you were present like for three months and through through whenever it becomes law. So if the question is, do I need an ITIN to help me prove that I was here on January 1st, 2021? I don't think so. Um, if the person who asked that question was thinking something else, I invite you to put that into the chat um, if there's something else. And the other, the, the final question that was asked during this, my segment um, was with regard to what documents school districts are providing to applicants. Uh, and for that one, I actually would defer to Ruth because um, it's been 20 years since I was in a classroom um, yeah. or, or yeah, go ahead, Ruth. So I'm gonna do a presentation right after this, a short little synopsis of the kinds of things that schools have on site. Um, but before I do that, thank you so much, Araceli. Rocio, is there anything you wanted to add? Uh, yes, so there was one question about whether the folks needed an IT number to apply for the California Dream Act. So for state financial aid, um, no, folks do not need an IT number to apply for state financial aid. Um, 
And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and add a link to a webinar that we have uh, titled everything you want to know about iTunes, um, but don't know what to ask. So we have that webinar to give folks more information about um, ITIN numbers. The other question that came was whether we have some of this information available in Spanish. Um, if you have students um, who would benefit from this information in Spanish, the one of the easiest way to be able to access some of this would be having folks following us on Instagram because we do have at noon uh, from 12 to 1, we're always there live um, doing information sessions so folks are able to ask their questions um, there. Um, and you all will have access to the presentation um, uh, that was shared uh, today as well. Um, so if you need to contact us, um, we do do presentations for educators and administrators. Um, so if you do find a need in making sure that uh, everyone in your staff is aware of these resources, uh, we do offer presentations to educators and administrators on these topics. Excellent. Thank you so much, Rocio, and to, and to both of you for this incredible information. Um, and if there's other questions that end up in the chat, we will certainly forward them to the presenters and we'll get them included on our landing page um, that will go out after the event. So thank you again so much. So we have one last section kind of to tie a bow on the day. And, and um, this section um, I'm going to be leading, actually, um, it's, it's related to systems of support. And um, what are those systems of support that a school or district can do in, in your role in supporting DACA? Um, so if you can move to the next slide, um, we, we need to think about, um, I, I've posed some questions for us to reflect on. And um, in the chat, there's going to be um, a little tool for you to use that you can use to reflect or to take back to your communities and think about what is it you have? So the first question is, um, who needs to hear about this information? Um, you may be thinking, oh, just older students that might be within this window, but actually there are older students who are in the window and may, may be able to qualify um, for, for this program, but there are also older students who may have um, younger siblings that are coming of age, or maybe they have older, uh, excuse me, older siblings of these students who may have um, not been able to apply because of the pause in the application process for DACA or maybe they're one of the 49, 47% of eligible DACA recipients who didn't apply. Um, you know, it's an optional thing and some people didn't apply. Um, and so they're, you know, they may be related <laughs> to someone. So think about them as possibly people that might wanna hear. Think about parents and families in your schools, no matter what level you are. Um, the parents and families may have older children they may have <laughs> who are citizens, but they themselves could be eligible for applying for DACA. So think about them also, even if you don't, even if you're in an elementary or middle school, um, you know, there may be families that need to know this information. Um, and also think about your staff. Your staff is interacting with families, um, not just your teachers, not just your counselors. Think about your frontline staff, the people who might be there when someone is looking for information or looking for um, uh, some documentation. Go to the next slide and I'm gonna talk to you about some of those pieces. So another, the second question um, that you might wanna be asking now about is what structures are already in place to connect you with those people who need this information? So, um, you know, when DACA first was implemented, I was actually working in a high school and I saw that there are systems already in place that people can utilize to just get that information out. And we saw time and time again, especially throughout COVID, that the things that were already in place were the things that parents responded to and knew about. And then they were able to get that information through those normal channels. So ELACs, DLACs, PTAs, PTOs, there's other parent organizations like cafes or um, different parent groups that might be on campus. You may have um, parenting partners or project to inspire, any kind of parent group that you may have could be an outlet or a way to get information to people. There might be student groups or clubs that you could channel some information to and get them some tools. Um, and, then, um, and then you also may be thinking about the data, data management staff, right? You might have regular meetings of your attendance clerks or registrars 
um, that regularly meet to talk about, you know, data, data entry, application, you know, you know, applying to, to or re or registering for school. Those people meet regularly, utilize those meetings um, to get them information that they need to be proactive and ready for when people come. Sometimes people might be coming uh, to your site and they don't know exactly what to ask for, but if, you're, um, if your individuals are ready and prepared, um, they, they may be able to you know, offer what's available. Um, teachers, administrators, counselors, of course, make sure they have information about DACA um, and at least about what it is that they can tell parents where they can go, you know, for information, um, and um, and then uh, support staff meetings as well. Parent liaisons, um, anyone else that is that is has any contact with parents or um, or students, and then community partnerships that you may already have on site or in your community, um, churches, um, people, groups like that um, that you may be connected to um, through your coalitions um, or your collabor collaboration models. Um, go ahead and make sure that you share with them, but also ask. They may already have speakers. They may already have people that, that are lined up and connected. And in a minute, I'll show you why they might have some. Go to the next slide, please. Another question you may ask yourself is, um, who, who can we bring in as speakers? This is one of the, um, the pieces that is really incredible. The California Department of Social Services funds organizations um, to provide um, legal, legal services or legal support for schools. I have just listed a sprinkling of them. There are dozens. And so um, in, in, our, in our tool, um, the, the data, data checklist, DACA checklist that you see there for schools, um, you will see a link and, it, and it'll take you straight to the Department of, uh, California Department of Social Services website. And it'll give you um, some information about um, uh, different organizations that have been approved. Um, they've been approved not just because they applied and they're anybody, but be, they've been vetted. They've been working with immigrants for many, many years. And so they're seen as trusted partners like schools are. Um, and so they're nonprofit um, for the most part, all, or, or they have been vetted to, to be able to do nonprofit um, uh, work of this nature. Um, and you may be surprised to see some of those, some you may recognize. Chirla is very active. Um, that's why I put them at the top, but there's many, many that are there. Um, but the Coalition for Human, um, Humane Immigrant Rights, they'll come out, they'll do presentations, they are connected across the whole state. So um, you can look up those. Um, one of the things we'll do is in our landing page, we'll put links on all of them so you can find them um, as well. Um, but, you know, you've got, you know, the Catholic Charities, um, you know, again, they're, they're um, linked to um, church organization, but they're very committed to get, helping people to get information about their rights. And there's dozens of others. Next slide, please. Um, so what we also um, want you to ask, and this question was one of the things um, you know, that I think people are, have on their mind is, how do we respond to requests for documentation? Well, first of all, you wanna anticipate who may be asking. Um, you wanna anticipate what records that they, they may be looking for that are helpful. And, um, and so when you're thinking about school, people that work in, in schools and understand maybe what's in that cumulative record, right? They may know that in that record, there are um, attend, you know, information about attendance, which also might be able to be downloaded you know, from a database, you know, attendance history. Um, you could print out, you can ask a registrar to print out, but there are also um, other kinds of information there that can be very, very helpful. There are, there's data in there like immunization records, which also has a date and a name on it. And it gives also information kind of fortifying the history of students. But remember too, it might not just be students. There may be parents that are um, also, you know, possibly applying parents. You know, remember this has been a long period. Some of them are, you know, already in their, in their um, late twenties, thirties. Those people may have records at, at schools as well that they could access. And so um, some records in schools might also be report cards, children, their own children's report cards or their own, right? Um, because the children's report cards might have the signature of the parent on it. There are so many different pieces of information that are there. So be anticipating what they may be asking for um, and what might be available. Um, and so identifying those people, as I mentioned before, in key positions that could support. Go to the next slide, please. And, um, and, and this is, there's some key messages we need to get out there. Every student, graduate students, they have a cumulative record. Many people don't know that. The parents don't know that necessarily. The files contain current and previous school records. 
So some parents don't realize that that final you know, school they're in, that that school had requested records from other schools. So make sure you're aware of it. And or you, I'm sure you're aware of it in your school, but make sure those parents are aware of it. The, another message is that they do not need a reason for requesting. Many of you know people request it all the time. Parents are going through a divorce. They want a record of, hit, of attendance. They do not need a reason for requesting this. So make sure your parents are aware of that. They don't have to say uh, the reason is, you know, I'm applying for DACA. No, they just need to say they'd like to look at records. They do not need a letter from an attorney. Sometimes attorneys will say, oh, I will provide you a letter. Give me this money. No, they do not need a letter. Make sure they're aware of that. And that they're also, the schools are required to follow strict policies. They can't be, you know, documenting who is asking for these letters and giving out information. There's, there's a lot of policies related to protecting data. Go to the next slide, please. Um, and remember, you're those trusted partners. And so be ready, be ready for them. And, um, and, you know, and thank you so much for, for being here. Um, the, the checklist that's there, it gives you lots of tools, lots of things that, that might be available. And I really encourage you, you know, to use it. Let us know, you know how it's working and helpful to you. And now here we are, we're at the end of the time. We're gonna be closing out with a final vote from the student. And I know we're running over one minute, but it's just a one minute message. If you can go to the next slide, please. We have, um, uh, I want to introduce Elmo um, Tumba Khan, and um, I'm not going to give you all the information. His bio is going to be in the landing page because I want you to hear this, but he is an amazing, amazing individual. He grew up in Southern California, and he's now studying at Oberlin College, and um, I would like to have you um, please play his voice. He will be the final voice of the night. Thank you so much for being here, and we're going to listen now to Elmo and they said, never mind, we take it back. You can't stay here anymore. And 250,000 Americans are told to leave their homeland for a country of origin, exchange their livelihoods for an 18th month waiting period, decide whether or not to go back to a place that has built no home for them. Veronica Lagunas of Los Angeles says, quote, we had hoped that if we worked hard, paid our taxes, and didn't get in trouble, we would be allowed to stay. And ain't that how we immigrants were taught to behave, to keep our heads low and be better than our neighbors, just so we could be regarded with some ounce of respect. Ain't it funny how even model citizenship can't earn a green card and a right to stay? to let a hand of compassion only to smack the palm that reached out when we finally got comfortable to invite a guest to your home set them down at your table only to remind them they will never be welcome this will never be the american normal we will not sit out these 18 months in silence gone with the days of not getting in trouble we will raise our heads up high demand for more judges like william alsop of california who continue to fight for american dreamers demand for our salvadoran nicaraguan sudanese honduran and haitian siblings right to stay to call each other neighbor demand that none of our siblings be temporary Thank you.